afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the penultimate session of this year's conference. We've made it this far. Um, I'm Sarah Proger. I'm Head of Communications and Development and the Acting Programme Lead for the IUCN UK Peatland Programme. And I'll be chair this morning. So we heard this morning about the risks to sustainable management. This afternoon, we'll hear about the risks of not managing our peatlands sustainably. So this session will explore the climate change risks to peatlands in the UK, as well as the role of peatlands in risk management associated with wildfires, natural flood management and slope stability. So like all of the sessions, can you please post your questions for speakers in the Q&A panel at the top of the chat window? Um, and we'll come to those live um, as a panel of speakers for the Q&A session at the end. So our first speaker this afternoon is Catherine Brown. So Catherine is the Director of Climate Action for the Wildlife Trust. Over to you, Catherine. Hi there, everybody. So I'm Catherine Brown and I'm the Wildlife Trust's new Director for Climate Change Action. And I'm going to be kicking off this afternoon's session uh, with a bit of a scene setter for us before going into the, the next set of presentations on climate change risks to peatlands in the UK. Um, and just to start things off, this is something you'll all be, be well aware of, having observed this over the course of the summer this year. But really just to make the point that globally we're already seeing these unprecedented extreme weather events happening at, at 1.1 uh, degrees of warming um, in 2021. And these are two of the, the really catastrophic um, events that, that we have seen during that time. So the, the first on the left is um, some pictures of the extreme temperatures in North America. That, that scale on the left goes up to 65 degrees Celsius. And we were observing temperatures well into the high 40s, approaching 50 degrees across um, much of a huge area, really, of, of North America. And um, the attribution studies that have been done since then suggested that, that this sort of event would be virtually impossible without human induced warming, even though it's still calculated to be a very rare event in today's climate, around one in a thousand. And on the right hand side is the, uh, the, the rainfall um, radar chart for uh, parts of Western Europe, including Germany on the 14th and 15th of July, where we saw really horrendous flooding um, across much of that area. And again, the, the World Weather Attribution Initiative has found that the likelihood of this type of event has increased by between two and nine times what it would have been um, without human induced global warming. So we talk about avoiding dangerous climate change. Dangerous climate change is already with us, uh, but there is still a lot we can do to prevent it getting much worse and to build resilience as well to the effects that we're already seeing, including in the UK. And if we just focus down on some of the projections of, of future UK climate, so the, uh, the Climate Change Committee published its latest assessment of climate risk, which is a five yearly statutory requirement under the Climate Change Act back in June. Um, and these are some of the high level figures really for how climate hazards uh, are likely to change and will change over the course of, of the century going forward. So these maps just show temperature on the top uh, and then low river flows and flood risk, um, both for the present day, which is the left hand map. Um, the, the more or less inevitable scenario by the 2050s under uh, roughly a two degree level of, of warming, a two degree pathway by 2100. And then what we could experience if we end up on a four degree pathway by 2100. Uh, and if you just look at some of these average maximum summer temperatures, so these are all averages rather than extremes, but uh, the projection suggests that, that that could increase by around another four degrees by 2050 and could be over eight degrees by 2080 under that high scenario. Changes in river flows at Q95, which is the, the standard low flow indicator that we use, they could be up to 20% worse than they are at present by the 2050s. Um, in fact, they're likely to be 20% worse by the 2050s and could be up to 50% worse by the 2080s. Uh, a number of people living in areas at significant flood risk. So this is something that, that we'll be looking at in more detail in a minute uh, with the following presentation. So this is the number of people living at, at a one in 75 return period or higher. That could increase by at least 60% by 2050 and could more than double by 2080. And that just sets the scene for the, the climate change risk assessment, which then goes on to look at um, 60, uh, over 60 different risks from climate change to the UK, including to its natural environment. Another one particularly, obviously, of relevance for upland peat is what will happen with wildfire. So these are projections of the percentage of days with very high 
uh, fire risk, what we call fire weather index, uh, in different scenarios. And again, you're seeing, you know, a doubling of the risk even in our uh, our inevitable scenario, our, our two degree more or less scenario. And actually, we could see up to a quadrupling of that risk in the four degree scenario in the summer. And what does that look like now under this um, under our present day climate? Well, this is uh, the Extreme Fire Danger Weather Service, which is um, produced Europe wide by the Copernicus Service. And this is just showing the fire danger forecast uh, for the 31st of August this year. And you can see how extreme it is in southern parts of Europe. And we can expect that kind of picture to, to move northwards as the climate continues to change and to start to affect the UK uh, much more severely. And this map just shows you the actual number of instances of fires uh, across Europe for this fire season this summer. Um, and, you know, we can see that there all have obviously been some instances of, of wildfires recorded across the UK and Ireland. But just look at the picture in southern Europe again. Again, this has been in the news quite a lot this summer. And this is the picture we do not want to see in the UK, but, but we will um, almost inevitably be seeing an increase in wildfire danger and need to start preparing for that, even in a very ambitious global mitigation uh, scenario for climate change. So what does this mean for, for peatlands in the UK? Well, it's it's not a positive picture um, when you look at the evidence uh, across things like the climate change risk assessment and specific studies that look at peatlands. But we need to bear in mind that we're there's a big difference between the risks to peatlands, which are an unfavourable condition, and the risks to peatlands that are being rewetted, actively rewetted, and are. Uh, peat forming, so in good condition. So this modelling, which is quite old now, this is um, a study from 2010, but suggested that between uh, about a half and two thirds of upland peat is at risk of loss by 2050 due to changing climate space. This is mainly hotter, drier conditions, um, which obviously if, if this were to occur would dramatically increase emissions from those uh, degraded peatlands as well. And this is still the most up-to-date study that, that we can find that looks at this idea of changing climate space for, for upland peat in particular. And there's also some studies that have been uh, done looking at lowland peat, um, again quite old, so this one is from 2013, but this looked at the time taken for the remaining um, peat layer in, in the fens to uh, disappear altogether both from a com the combination of land use change, continued land use change, continued intensive farming, but what climate change does to, to speed up that process, if you like, at the same time. Uh, and assuming there's no climate change, um, two different scenarios, you're looking at maybe with, with current land use practices, current, you know, a continuation of intensive agriculture between 40 and 80 years for that remaining peat layer to disappear. But when you add climate change, it brings that down drastically to um, to anything as, as quickly as 30 years, which obviously is, is very concerning as well. Again, we haven't seen these studies being updated recently, um, so that would be a really good project to look at. But the, the, the point really to make here is that early adaptation, early resilience building can do a huge amount to reverse those kinds of worrying trends. So we know that up, both upland and lowland peat have a much greater chance of persisting and, and adapting themselves to hotter, drier conditions when they are in good condition. And we also know there's a lot of economic analysis that shows that the net benefits of doing that restoration and doing it early are very high. So some studies, very location dependent, but the, the benefit cost ratios can be as high as 12 to 1. And there's also been study looking studies looking at uh, specific locations and what happens when you do um, when you start doing peatland restoration now as opposed to waiting 20 or 30 years and the the, the big increase in net net benefits you see if you do that action now and and as we've said you know climate change makes that case for action much more urgent than than if we weren't having to deal with climate change at the same time so where does that leave us well the England peat action plan which was published um, quite recently commits to around 10% of the total area uh, of peatlands in England being restored by 2025, around 35,000 hectares. But given the risks from climate change, we need to see 100% of peatland, both upland and lowland, being restored, being rewetted, being converted to wet agriculture. Um, and we want to see those targets in, in the upcoming net zero strategy, looking out to 2050 to get that, that complete restoration, um, much bigger scale, much more activity happening than, than we have seen in, in recent government commitments. 
obviously abound on rotational burning is really important as well to try and um, try and get upland peat back into its rewetter condi condition. Switching from intensive farming to wet farming on lowland peat where farming still makes economic sense and obviously a wholesale ban on peat and compost, including through imports as well. And just lastly, um, just to bring my 10 minutes to a close, just to put that in perspective, the government target of 35,000 hectares, well, if you look at what the Wildlife Trusts are doing, actually, we've already restored much more than that, 46,000 hectares um, to date so far in a huge range of projects. And, and some of these are, are absolutely brilliant to go and look at. And one of my first uh, tasks in my new role, which I've just started at the Trust, was to go and see one of the brand new uh, restoration projects on Honeygar Farm in Somerset, which is the, the photograph in the middle, which is an intensive farm on lowland peat, which has been bought out by Somerset Wildlife Trust and will be rewilded um, and rewetted. And the, the Wildlife Trust have brilliant examples all over the country. There's some other photographs here from the Great Fen project, some of the Upland projects as well. And there's a link provided if you're interested to go and have a look at some of that brilliant work that's going on. Thanks, Catherine, for laying out very clearly that climate change is making the case for urgent further action on peatlands to increase resilience for all of us. So our next speaker up is Roxanne Anderson. So Roxanne um, is a professor of peatland science and a senior research fellow um, at the ERI at University of Highlands and Islands, uh, where Roxanne leads on carbon, water and climate research themes. Over to you, Roxanne. Hello, my name is Roxanne Anderson and I'm here today on behalf of the Fire Blanket team to present some of the results of our NERC Argency funded project that looked at how land management influenced fire resilience and carbon feed in blanket bogs. Although this is a project about fire, it really started with the severe and extended drought that occurred in 2018 and led to uh, high temperature and reduced precipitation in uh, all of the UK, including the far north of Scotland, particularly during the month of May to July. That was then followed in May 2019 by the largest recorded UK wildfire, and it was large enough to fit all of the other UK wildfires of that year within its footprint. Note here that this was also a record wildfire year, so the year following the drought was a, year, a record year for the number and the size of wildfires that had been recorded. The Flow Country wildfire is estimated to have burned approximately 60 kilometres square of blanket bog and started between the villages of Strathy and Melvick in the far north of Scotland along the north coast and burned southwards all the way to the Force and Art Flows Nature, National Nature Reserve. During the wildfire, or shortly after the wildfire, uh, WWF Scotland was commissioned to produce a report that would provide an estimation of car the carbon emission associated with the fire. And using kind of modelling approach and back of the envelope calculation, they came up with an estimate of 174 to 294 kilotons of CO2 equivalent emitted during the six or seven days that the, the wildfire was actively burning. In other words, during those days, and while only burning approximately 0.07% of the land area, this particular wildfire is thought to have doubled Scotland's greenhouse gas emission. It is quite significant. Scientifically, the Flow Country fire was quite interesting because it impacted uh, the different land uses that are found throughout the region, including wet Eath and drained blanket bog that have been impacted by peat cutting and are generally heather dominated. Areas that have active drains um, and areas where those same drains have been blocked and therefore kind of rewetted, as well as areas where there was never any active drain and therefore near natural. Areas that have deep uh, forestry plantations on deep peat and areas where those plantations are or were in the process of being removed, so forest to bog areas. All of the, these different land uses had been impacted by the, the fire and shortly after the fire, Nature Scott was able to send a team to do a combination of field-based and remote sense-based assessment of fire severity, which you can see in the, in the background on the map here. But some of the more severe areas impacted at the very top with the wet feet and peat cutting areas and some of the least severely impacted areas around the kind of near natural and rewetted areas. The 
per the overall aim of the Fire Blanket project, which was an ARC urgency grant uh, that I was leading, um, was really to understand how these different land management influenced the fire resilience and the fate of the carbon in blanket fogs. And to achieve that, we used a combination of approaches, including vegetation surveys, so extensive uh, vegetation surveys on over nearly 400 quadrats were uh, visited where vegetation was recorded as well as fire impact, I included matched burnt and unburnt as well as drain and open ground. And as well as the 2019 fire, it also included some older fires to look at longer term vegetation recovery. We also had a monthly sampling of 50 different streams or rivers, um, including catchment with drains and undrained areas and different proportion of burnt areas. And the, in those catchments, we looked at the, the or in those water samples, we looked at the carbon, the organic matter, cations, metals and nutrients to understand what happens after the fire to all of these different um, um, aquatic exports. And finally, we used as well the um, kind of INSAR based uh, surface motion monitoring um, to capture how the drought in particular before the fire had influenced the, the surface uh, in, in all of those different land management areas. What we were able to do with that is collect enough empirical data to provide a, an interesting understanding of what happens during the drought and during the fire. So what we found really was that before the fire, during the drought, all the areas that are generally dominated by sphagnum and in con good condition were able to subside quite rapidly. And that's a known mechanical feedback that uh, leads to an increase in surface moisture and that increase in surface moistures in turn was uh, correlated with lower intensity and severity of wildfire, which suggests a faster recovery in the future. On the opposite side, the very highly degraded areas uh, did not have that mechanical feedback. Uh, mechanism, they were the, the surface did not move during the drought that increased in the aeration of the peat surface, the cracks, and therefore created a higher fuel load below the vegetation, so the peat, um, that was more susceptible to high severity and intensity. In turn, that prov provides also a better um, environment for heather dominance and uh, species like Malinia to, to succeed, and, and that continues that kind of positive feedback, if you like. So areas that were in good condition were better able to, to resist the fire and are more likely to be more resilient in the long term, whereas degraded areas lacked that resilience mechanism. We presented that evidence to a group of uh, stakeholders during a workshop where the idea was to try to develop future proof management strategies for drains and in particular a forested blanket box. And the idea was really to explore potential ways that we could manage the land better to um, increase that resilience and reduce those, those risks. And we presented a couple of scenarios to the people in the, in, in the workshop. And the first scenario was one where we would uh, manage landscape structure to reduce the scale of the fire spread by creating and managing fire breaks um, and making and exploiting uh, natural features like streams or lochs or, or areas of pool system um, to, to reduce the risk of fire uh, spreading, so having very large wildfires. Um, and what was identified by the, the workshop participants was that there was some opportunities in, in that approach. For example, we could potentially identify um, proactively identify sites and infrastructure that need to be isolated and protected and consider building fire breaks around those areas. Um, and we could also potentially use uh, existing road or, or tracks or lay that are more likely to be hotspots for ignition because of higher public use and consider extending fire breaks alongside these. However, there were some barriers uh, around this, for example, the, the need to balance this quick fix approach against other risks, for example, would uh, increasing a fire break be adverse in terms of biodiversity or water? And also the fact that in some areas they were just impractical, undesirable or, um, or required technical trained staff and equipment in any case. So they're, they're maybe not the most um, cost, cost effective uh, solution. The alternative scenario was, was that we proposed was really to manage the fuel load and the surface moisture to reduce the fire impact by uh, in, improving the re restoration management strategy 
um, creating, uh, for example, making sure that re-wetted areas were, were targeted in relation to their uh, fire risk as well as other um, other elements in, in, in the kind of strategic thinking. Um, the opportunities in that scenario was, was that there was already uh, an existing funding mechanism for the delivery of large-scale peatland restoration and that perhaps there was a way of, of using that. There was also the, the need uh, to, uh, to consider the, the opportunity for promoting the removal of felling material in particular post uh, forestry restoration, um, because that was recognized as one of, of the potential high risk areas. In, in some of the kind of barriers for, for this scenario was really the difficulty to implement best practice in terms of the brush removal where it was currently financially prohibitive and that some areas may not be restorable cost effectively or at all, and that we would need to, to consider those areas in a, in a kind of landscape scale approach to a strategic uh, management. In, in asking what the participant thought about what was most achievable in the short term, we, we said, uh, let's do nothing. Let's implement the lessons that we learned from the Four Country Fire, increasing better coordination of the response between the fire service and, and the land managers, um, manage the spread with fire breaks, manage the severity by increasing restoration, or do all of those approaches, or combine those approaches a bit better. And it was really that combination of approaches that was thought to be the most effective way forward. Um, and Im importantly, none of the participants thought that we should do no changes at all. We then asked the participant to tell us what they thought was the, the key gaps in knowledge that we still needed to fill in terms of understanding where this research should go and the, the really the key thing is that most of the participants felt that we still didn't have a very good understanding of the cost effectiveness of management strategies and in particular of the, of the climate change land use and fire risk kind of interaction and these were really the areas where more research should be focused. So the, the key take home messages here are really that fire blanket provides empirical evidence of resilience mechanism that is lost through degradation associated with increased fire severity and post drought year. And that's in the form of the mechanical compression of the surface that leads to increased moisture. The climate change prediction are currently including more frequent drought and increased number of days with severe fire danger. Therefore, having resilient areas is going to be really important in the future and strategic land management interventions can help reduce the risk of large and severe wildfires once ignited. And there is an appetite amongst the stakeholders and the landowners that we contacted to, to do something about it. But importantly as well, the, it was identified that nearly all wildfire in the UK are ignited by humans. So education and communication of risk is absolutely key. And we cannot move forward with land management strategies if the public is not going to be educated enough to stop lighting those fires in the first place. I'd like to just thank the whole team who contributed to, to the project and the wider team that was involved in the, in the delivery and organization and participation in the workshop. And just thank you all for listening. And I'm not able to be in person present today, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions or uh, provide further information if you just contact me by emails. Thank you very much. That's great. Well, thank Roxanne for that introduction to the results of the Fire Blanket project. So looking at how land management influences fire resilience and the carbon fate of blanket bogs, which I think we all agree is, is hugely important. Um, if I can remind you to pop any questions for speakers in the Q&A panel at the top of the chat uh, window, uh, that would be grand and we can come to those at the Q&A session at the end. So our next speaker of this afternoon is Chris Fry. So Chris is a conservation quality manager for the Moors for the Future Partnership. And Chris is gonna share uh, Moors for Future's work on collating an evidence base for wildfires across the South Pennine Moors special area of conservation. Over to you, Chris. Hello there, I'm Chris Fry. I work for Moors for Future as a conservation quality manager. I'll be presenting this uh, talk about uh, Moors of 2020s wildfire work which has been done by Paul Titterton. So, so as I say this work is collating an evidence base for wildfires across the South Pennine Moors special area of conservation and it's been led by Paul Titterton. Uh, well, more life 2020 is creating a database of wildfires across the South Pennine Moors special area of conservation. 
This is creating a wildfire recording tool to monitor the number of wildfire incidents that have occurred. It is important to undertake this work because it helps to understand the reasons behind why wildfires occur and therefore help tackle them and can be used to identify the spatial distribution of wildfires to understand if there is any problem areas. To increase awareness of wildfires by allowing all partners and academic institutions access to the database and providing this information to partners will help develop a more comprehensive, detailed evidence base associated with the scale, risk and impact of wildfires. We are defining a wildfire as any wildfire that is burning strongly and out of control on an area of grass or bushes in the countryside and excluding managed burns. That's from Cambridge University 2017. And our data covers the whole of the South Ben and Moors Special Area Conservation, but it's just Moors wildfires and it includes a 250 metre buffer zone around the Moorland line. Data provided over time have changed and increased, starting with the Peak District National Park Authority since 1976, but also the United Utilities, the RSPB, uh, the Fire and Rescue Service in various regions, and Natural England and the National Trust have all contributed. All variables were asked for. There was one actual explosion recorded. In total, there were 114 different variables recorded. This was then refined to eight key variables including coordinates of where the wildfire occurred, the date, the area burnt, estimated area burnt, the cause of the ignition, if it was accidental or deliberate, the reason for ignition, such as a barbecue, the age group responsible, and the victims involved. And the results show us there's a lot of missing data. It's, and it also it's important to differentiate between not applicable and not collected, and it's important to collect as much data as you can where possible as it helps to provide a fuller picture. The table on the left shows you how much data was missing and so therefore we're just not able to see what that might show. But what we can see is that wildfire numbers vary across the years and when it's difficult to see clear trends. However, most wildfires occur in the spring. We can see that. March and May in particular. Wildfires can, however, happen in most months if the fuel and weather permitted. Why do, we, why do wildfires occur? They primarily started deliberately. Significant numbers of recalls are left blank, which impacts on the results. 14 different reasons why wildfires occur including exposure to a naked flame as the highest. Smoking related material may also have a significant contribution, although I think current work at Exeter University is looking into this in more detail. The actual number of wildfires in damage for uh, meter squared was 152,000 meters squared of actual damage since 2007, and that's not including 2018 data whereas the estimated wildfire damage was 598,000 metres squared of estimated damage since 2007, again not including 2018 data. So you can see there's a big difference between the actual and the estimated wildfire damage. Moving forward, you'll update the wildfire database annually. Once the wildfire recording tool is up and running, it will hopefully replace this database going forwards. It allows stakeholders to update, potential to contribute, to continue after more asset 2020, we hope, through other projects and other funding. And it will allow easier access to data by stakeholders. The conclusions, or well, the database included all wildfires recorded from 1976 to 2017 for the whole of the South Ben and Moors Special Area of Conservation. The analysis was undertaken using data from 2007 onwards. Results only tell us so much. It's not. It's really important to collect all data where possible and to distinguish if it's not relevant or not applicable. Collecting better wildfire data in the future is critical if we are to understand and manage this risk more effectively. 
Wildfires generally happen in the spring months. There are a variety of different causes, but the vast majority, if not all of them, are caused by people. In total, wildfires caused an estimated 750,000 metres squared worth of damage in 10 years between 2007 and 2017. Some references. Any questions? That's great. Thanks, Chris. So our next presentation moves us from risk management of wildfires to the risk management associated with natural flood management at Heatland. So our next speaker who I'll hand over to is Julie Foley. So Julie is the Director of Flood Risk Strategy and Natural Adaptation at the Environment Agency. Over to you, Julie. Hello, I'm Julie Foley and I'm Director of Flood Risk Strategy at the Environment Agency. Um, thank you for the opportunity to ask me to make a short presentation at your conference. I'm sorry I can't be with you at the conference itself. Um, I'd like to say a few words about our approach to national flood risk management in England. I'm going to hone in on natural flood management. And one of the first things I want to do and is bring up some slides and, uh, and to talk about the climate emergency, because I think that very much sets the backdrop for all of our work. It can't have escaped your notice, particularly over the summer, um, that climate change events, whether or not that's wildfires or major catastrophic flood events, have been present, ever, ever present in many parts of Europe and indeed, of course, across America as well. And here we had some major surface water flood events in London. And what's clear is that climate change is not just something for the future, it is absolutely happening here and now, and it's already causing more frequent intense flooding and sea level rise. What we know is that even with ambitious global and national actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, some further climate change is now inevitable. Climate scientists suggest that sea levels could rise by up to a metre by the end of the century, but actually the latest survey and, and work from the Inter Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change suggests that we could see up to a metre potentially by the end of the century. That's really difficult to comprehend, isn't it? And will clearly require us to really think very differently about how we plan and adapt to climate change. And that was at the heart of our new national FCRM strategy uh, that we published last year and laid in Parliament in the autumn. And it sits alongside the DEFRA Flood and Coastal Erosion Management Policy Statement, and it very much sets us up, I think, very well to be thinking about green and clean recovery, particularly in the year of COP26. If I go on a slide, I'm going to talk to you about the strategy's vision and ambitions. It sets out a bold vision for a nation ready for and resilient to flooding and coastal change today, tomorrow and the year 2100. And on the slide, you can see the three ambitions of the strategy. But the heart of the strategy, if I was just going to sum it up in a few words, is this concept of moving from protection to one of resilience. And that recognises that we need to absolutely continue to build flood and sea defences. That remains vitally important. Um, but it can't be the only part of our solution to dealing with the climate emergency. And we can't expect to build our way out of future climate risks. And in the face of the changing climate, we need to ensure that we make our places more resilient to flooding and coastal change so that when it does happen, it causes much less harm to people, does much less damage and ensures that life can get back to normal much more quickly. What, what does that mean? Well, it means we need to look at things like nature-based solutions, for example, that help to slow the flow and store floodwaters. And I'll come back and discuss that in a bit more detail. But it also means we need to ensure that we're avoiding inappropriate development in the floodplain. We're better preparing communities um, for when flooding does happen through excellent flood warning and instant response. And we need to be building back better, helping not just properties and businesses, but also land managers to recover faster. If I go on a slide, I wanted to now focus a bit more on the opportunities around nature based solutions and natural flood management. Um, and this very has a really key plank in our strategy and the role of land managers and farmers will be absolutely vital to thinking about how we mainstream nature based solutions a lot better. 
On the next slide, we've got some pictures here of a wide range of examples of using natural flood management to reduce flood risk. I'm sure you're familiar with many of yourselves. Um, but, you know, at the heart of it, it's about slowing and reducing flows to reduce flood levels, or it's about attenuating and storing water temporarily so that we can release it later when, when, um, when, when, when appropriate after the heavy rain has passed. Um, natural flood management can mean many things. It can mean major floodplain storage, managed realignment of the coast, changes to farming techniques, as well as things like woody dams, for example, and structures on rivers to help slow the flow. Now, it's important to recognise that we, we actually already use natural flood management quite a lot. It's um, often when we take forward flood projects in a catchment, it is becoming increasingly common to use a mixture of both hard and soft engineering. Our natural flood management, particularly in a wider catchment, is often really effective at reducing flood risk, particularly alongside other interventions like traditional defences. And the other really key benefit is, is, of course, not just reducing flooding, even though that's the primary purpose, but uh, it can also help to create habitats for wildlife, provide water quality improvements, as well as um, provide means for carbon storage. Um, there are many examples here, but I'll just um, pick out a couple. So on the bottom left is, is an example in Leicester, where we've worked with Leicester City Council on a project that's reduced flood risk to nearly 5,000 properties in the city from the River Saw. And that's involved a series of green infrastructure and a number of open spaces. Um, the great thing about that project is it's also led to 1.5 hectares of wetland habitat in Leicester itself, greatly improving the natural environment. And on the top right is, is, a, is a very well um, uh, provided example, which is on Pickering, which I'm sure you've, you've heard about, where we've worked with partners, notably the Forest Commission, who is the land manager, to look at woody dams and opportunities to control storage in the upper catchment, as well as, of course, through woodland creation. And that's provided a really effective means of using natural flood management to slow the flow through that catchment. If I go on the slide, because I, I just wanted to acknowledge the devastating impact um, that flooding obviously has when it happens on land managers and on farmland. Often when you hear about flooding, the media tends to focus. You see pictures of, of flooded homes and businesses, and obviously that, that's quite rightly a, a, a huge priority. Um, but of course, flooding has devastating impacts on agricultural land and productivity as well. We have 1.5 million hectares of agricultural land in England at risk from flooding from rivers in the sea. Over half of that is high grade agricultural land. My operational background in the Environment Agency is in the Fens, and that is you know, a classic example where we've got high value agricultural land in a very low lying area, obviously where we've got very valuable peatland as well, where there is a really delicate balance to play between managing flood risk and water levels and wider food security, of course. And we know that flooding does have a significant impact on agricultural productivity. Um, the most um, significant impacts was actually from the 2013-14 floods, uh, which was at the same time as the East Coast tidal surge, where 45,000 hectares of agricultural land was flooded uh, at a cost of £19 million to the sector. What's important for me to also flag, though, is that through the Environment Agency's investments in, in better flood protection, we have also made some great improvements here. Uh, we've better protected 280,000 hectares of agricultural land um, from flooding over the last six years, and that's helped to avoid more than £500 million worth of economic damage to agricultural land production. And obviously, with our future programme and the work that will be going forward, we'll make sure that that continues to be a priority as an outcome from our work. If I go on a slide, because I know this is very much the focus of the conversations you're having today on peatland management and restoration. I think it's fair to say, and it's well understood, that some historic land management practices um, haven't always helped us really with good water level management and sustainability. Um, lower water, lowered water tables has have increased surface water runoff, and we know drainage of peatland uh, makes it more vulnerable to erosion. 
And there's a real opportunity for us to think about how we look at peatland restoration hand in hand with good flood risk management and water level management, as well as opportunities to, of course, enhance carbon capture and storage. And if I just go on to my final slide, because this is where um, I'm keen to uh, talk about, I think that the again, the opportunities that I think are coming, particularly with the work that the Lowland Peat Agricultural Task Force are undertaking. That's a DEFRA led task force that's chaired by Robert Caldwell. Um, uh, I'm, I'm on that task force along with another a wide range of other partners, including from Natural England, ADA, and the RSPB, and others. And uh, we're exploring some really important conversations about what integrated water level management means in peatland areas, particularly lowland peatland areas. And across peatland areas more generally, you know, how can we start to think about where it's appropriate, uh, how we might look at water storage during rainfall events to provide peatland farmers and land managers with reserves of water that they can utilise during times of short supply. And I, as I said, I think that balance between looking at water level management, where we know our catchments uh, frequently have issues to do with too little and at other times too much water at different points in the year. How can we think about that as a new way of exploring how we have sustainable peat restoration? And I think there's some really significant opportunities for us to think about that when we think about flood resilient places and our response to the climate emergency. And I very much hope that that will be something that we can explore with partners in years to come. And it's something that we'll see some recommendations from uh, from the task force in due course. Thank you for having me and uh, I hope you found that very useful. Thank you. And thanks, Julie, for um, for sharing that presentation with us, even though you can't be with us live this afternoon. Much appreciated. Um, so we'll come to the last speaker of this session. Um, the last speaker is going to talk about risk management uh, in relation to slope stability and peatlands. So our last speaker is Richard Lindsay, who's head of environment, uh, environmental and conservation research at the Sustainability Research Institute of the University of East London. Richard's also a senior research advisor for our IUCN UK peatland programme as well as a peatland expert, a video maker, a music composer, a 3D modeler, an inspired creator of the virtual peatland pavilion. The list goes on. I shall, however, hand over to Richard to talk about slope, slope stability. Richard. Some years ago, I was contacted by a certain Martin Collins, resident of a very small village which clings to the southern slopes of the Sleeve-Ochty Mountains in Galway, Ireland. Much against the wishes of the villagers, the largest wind farm in Ireland was being built on the hill summit above the village. This hill, Cashlorn Drumlahan, is entirely draped with blanket mire peat, some of it more than five metres deep, but by then largely afforested with conifers. The residents feared that construction of the wind farm could destabilise the peat, but the developers, in a phrase now famous in the world of environmental impact statements, confidently assured the planning authority that no impacts of an exceptionally severe nature, e.g. contamination of an aquifer, destruction of a unique habitat, are possible through the construction and operation of this project. It seems that the fates disagreed with this bold demonstration of hubris because on the 16th of October 2003, the peat began to move. Slowly at first, but following heavy rain, the movement became a torrent of liquid peat, which flowed for almost two weeks, was featured repeatedly on RTE News, and eventually travelled some 20 kilometres down the Oendalula River until it entered the SAC, Loch Kutra, near the town of Gort. Fortunately, this catastrophic peat slide had turned left instead of right on its journey down the mountains, so it missed 
the village of Derry Bryan. The villagers were then assured by the wind farm operators that there was no possibility of further such events. Not surprisingly, the villagers had little faith in such assurances, so they commissioned me and Dr Olivia Bragg to look into the causes of the slide and make an assessment of the potential for further slides. Our report helped the villagers to win cases against the Irish planning system and the Irish government in both the Irish High Court and in the European Court of Justice. Unbelievably, the case continues to this day. The Irish government has been prosecuted by the European Court of Justice for a second time, very recently, for failing to address the consequences of the slide and undertake an adequate EIS, with the result that fines of €15,000 per day are being imposed on the Irish government until it sorts the problem out. I tell you this story as an object lesson in what can happen and how prolonged the pain can be if the risk of peatland slope stability is not adequately addressed when constructing anything on peat, but particularly when constructing wind farms. The NIMBY story of wind farms is invariably about turning a wild land into an industrial landscape often combined with concerns about blade noise. These may or may not be valid, depending on your perspective, but the turbines themselves are not the core issue when it comes to peatlands. It's the fact that for construction and maintenance, the turbines require service roads, which cut across the peatland hydrological landscape. Three methods of road construction are employed simple excavation through shallow peat, rock fill in somewhat deeper peat, and floating roads on deep peat. It's clear that excavated roads represent a wide trench or drain cutting through the blanket mire hydrology. Rock fill with carriageway may permit some filtration of water through the rock, but is rarely used as it requires huge amounts of material. Floating roads are described as such because they are claimed to float across the peat and require no drainage, so they do not harm the peatland hydrology. It was a floating road which failed at Derry Bryan. The catastrophic environmental disaster, not my words, of Derry Bryan led to some hard thinking in, amongst other places, Scottish Government. This, in turn, led to production of the Scottish Government Peat Landslide Hazard and Risk Assessments Best Practice Guide for Proposed Electricity Generation Developments. Kind of slips off the tongue, doesn't it? This document provides really good, very good guidance for anyone contemplating construction of a wind farm on peat, provided the guidance is followed faithfully. And that is the thrust of my presentation today. The first thing to highlight about the guidance is that it emphasizes how much uncertainty still exists, even if the guidance is followed to the letter. Most geoengineering tools are not designed for or well suited to working in peat. Indeed, if you consult any soil mechanics or geoengineering textbook, you'll be lucky to find more than a passing reference or a page or two to the challenges of working with peat. The guidance, which is widely recognized as the best currently available, approaches the challenge through four key stages. Review of conditions conducive to peat slope failure, a scoping study assessing evidence for such conditions on the site, a detailed site investigation and a hazard assessment. I will just highlight three areas of many that wind farm assessments frequently fail to address even when following this guidance. 
Firstly, many wind farms are established on peat, which has previously been a forested with conifers. The impact of the conifers over the years has been to dry out the peat, causing it to shrink and crack, particularly along the ploughing furrows, but also forming peat pipes. These cracks and pipes represent serious weaknesses in the overall integrity and strength of a peatland. Yet, environmental assessment rarely attempts to map these features in any detail, despite the fact that they are key preconditioning elements of slope failure. Secondly, the Scottish guidance emphasises the unreliable nature of assessing peat strength using shear vanes. A shear vane is a sort of paddle which is pushed into the peat and the resistance to its rotation is judged to measure peat strength. Papers have been published highlighting the unreliability of this standard geoengineering technique on peat. Nevertheless, shear vane results are still frequently relied upon in EIS submissions. Finally, in assembling a hazard statement, the current measured state of the peatland is used to assess long-term hazard, yet the very presence of the wind farm will change the nature of the peat. Wind farms invariably require drainage, even for floating roads, because these roads sink into the peat over time. Indeed, some schemes even state that a robust scheme of drainage will be used to consolidate the peat. The problem with this approach is that drainage consolidates, but also dislocates. Under the influence of drainage, the peat will increasingly shrink and crack. Peat pipes will form, and so an increasing number of preconditioning features associated with slope failure will develop over time. This is particularly concerning given that climate projections suggest increased occurrence of dry weather followed by intense rainstorms ideal conditions for allowing storm water to enter the peat, travel to the peat mineral interface, where it lifts the peat from the mineral through water pressure and buoyancy, and we have another Derry Brian. Ireland has had several spectacular peat slides arising from just such conditions in only the last couple of years. You can see them on YouTube although none as yet as spectacular as Derry Bryan, that long flowing and long running example of risk assessment failure. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So there's a great summary of a variety of risks of not managing our peatlands sustainably. Um, and we've got a good selection of questions to put to our panel of speakers. Um, I'd first like to introduce Chris Marshall. So Chris is a peatland scientist from the University of Highlands and Islands, who is joining us in place of Roxanne this afternoon. So thank you for that, Chris. Um, so we'll go straight over to the questions from the, the audience. Um, the first one and most popular one is, given the constraints on restoration funding and resources, and the huge scale of the task ahead of us, should we be prioritising restoration to those peatlands most likely to be resilient to climate change over the next 50 to 100 years? An interesting question, I would say. So we'll put that to, to Catherine first. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, Based on my level of knowledge, I would say probably yes, but I would also say, um, judging from the work that, that, say, the Wildlife Trust have done, you know, they've already restored something like 46,000 hectares of peat through the funding they've had to date, but they've identified another 200,000 hectares on land that is within Wildlife Trust um, areas that could be restored if funding was available. So it's it, the, the constraint may not be so much that um, 
that there are only certain peaks that we should be restoring it is obviously a funding issue. And it is not out of the question that that funding could be made available. If we looked at the benefits, as I've mentioned in my introductory presentation, the benefits that are accrued from doing this. So I, I wouldn't say you should rule out any peatland that, that is restorable in the face of climate change on the base funding um, funding constraints alone. There may be some potentially that are, that are beyond restoration already, um, but th there's a huge gap about the new Elm scheme coming through and lots of other schemes um, that really should be targeted because this is one of the most beneficial things you can possibly do to combat climate change in the future in the UK through nature-based solutions. So it, it, it feels a little bit like giving up too early to me to be trying to prioritise too soon without looking at that funding question first. OK, thanks, Catherine. Would anyone else like to come on that? Richard, do you want to come in on that? Oh, sorry, Chris, you popped your hand up there first. So, um, I was just wondering if I understood the question, question correctly, is it asking should we target the low hanging fruit, the things we can get to best? And I have concerns about that because we're only just learning what we can do. And so, I, as I mentioned the other day, I'm really worried about ourselves imposing our own false ceilings on what we might achieve. Bear in mind what innovation might provide in time. Yeah, I, I think we've also created, obviously, funding constraints notwithstanding. I think there's also issues of kind of remnant peatlands as well there. I don't know if, Richard, you wanted to, to, to come in on that? Uh, yes, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, there's a couple of points. Uh, firstly, the idea that we have peatlands that are perhaps on the on the boundary of what can and can't be uh, restored because of climate. Uh, it's worth pointing out that they are having successful restoration uh, way down on Exmoor, and they're doing successful restoration on the blanket bogs of northern Spain. So I really don't think any of our peatlands have a problem. We know that peatlands are incredibly resilient in, in the face of climate change, as long as we've got them back to functioning systems. The second point I would um, just highlight is the danger of saying either or. Uh, you know, I don't think it's helpful to say, well, we'll only go for this sort of peatland and uh, prioritise that. I think surviving natural systems do need to be protected, but we have huge opportunities, as Chris Evans was highlighting the other day, with extremely damaged sites, where actually the carbon capture potential for those in some ways exceeds that of the natural sites. So let's keep it flexible. Thanks, Richard. I think we could probably stick on this question all afternoon. So we'll move on um, so we actually get to, to some of the others. So our next most popular question, um, and this is perhaps to the, the two Chris's, um, why do most wildfires occur in the spring when the fire risk is generally considered highest in the summer? And if I can put that to Chris Marshall first. Um, so from my field, so I'm a look at sort of uh, satellite radar and ground motion. Um, I think one of the things that sort of happens in the spring is that you have sort of land use related sort of uh, activities, for example, sometimes burning and things like that. But at the same time, you're actually going into the sort of trough in the, the, the peatlands are tending to dry out actually in the sort of early spring to late spring so actually you're getting a sort of like a crossover between those two activities at the, the, the same time um at least from a, a ground motion point of view which is indicating that you're drying out earlier than you might expect and i think that's partially what contributed to the uh sort of the uh flow country fire i think that's sort of one of the aspects Specs in that actually we're sort of almost getting an intersection of a natural process of the sort of uh, swelling and shrinking of the peat and actually they they might have not been uh, compatible with each other and then it, um, it, it sort of that that sort of increases your risk so I think that might be an is issue with, with sort of just the timings of things and as well it seems in the flow country that we're getting much drier springs currently than we were previously and um, whereas the summers tend to be 
slightly worse than you used to be. So you seem, you seem to get like um, September and so it's more the autumn and the spring when we get the prolonged dry periods rather than the, the summer. Um, so I think it is that sort of like natural processes intersecting with land use potentially is a way of sort of that might be responsible for that sort of that trend uh, but yeah that, <laughs> that's as much as i know <laughs> thanks chris chris fry did you want to come in anything to add to that <clears throat> well uh, yeah, a couple of bits well, to, to, well, i was see is which when the the think of the fire triangle the fuel and the ignition come very close you've got a lot of dry fuel out from the Everything stopped growing over the winter, lost its moisture, and you get dry winds from Siberia, for example, and dry, dry the fuel out. Uh, particularly if you're on degraded peat, then you can have a lot of dry fuel around. Um, secondly, the ignition, which is people. And so I think around about Easter, we do that. That is when we start to go outside and enjoy ourselves, enjoy the summer sunshine. And so I heard that's when we have two, the two things, the driest of fuel and the most a, a surge in ignition events, in effect, as we all go outside again. Um, so I, I think you know, Easter time is a time when events can happen because there's, there's a lot of people flocking to the Easter holidays into the countryside. So I think it's about the fuel and the emission. Both of those risks, right, they peak and, and meet each other. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, so sticking with, with the techniques around monitoring wildfire and the, the impacts of wildfire, one of our questions was around, can you use te techniques sorry, like INSAR to predict wildfire hotspots? and assess post-fire burn severity. I guess that's probably back to yourself, Chris Fry, first. I am the last person to ask about remote sensing, to be fair. <laughs> oh, no, we can, we can leave Chris Fry for that one. Chris Marsh, other Chris. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so um, we, as part of the Fire Blanket project, we did look at the pre-fire, just because that was the data that we already had available, but we are in the process of getting um, the INSAR data or the ground motion data for post fire from that area. So what we actually need is because they're, they're almost like um, the INSAR is sort of vulnerable to sort of full stops or if you have like a rapid drop, sometimes it will lose coherence so you won't be able to use it. So we need to build up enough sort of, sort of data to be able to actually do the post fire sort of response. Um, I'm guessing just looking from the how it from the drought is that things will re-establish relatively quickly in terms of coherence and how it actually will view be able to see things. So you will end up with um well, at least from our experience from the droughts, is that you will definitely get differences in how different parts of the landscape are responding. For example, how the margins are responding and the slopes. Um, and there seems to be a very clear difference between how margins and centres are sort of centres of, uh, of peatlands, where the pool systems are, are responding to sort of drying events and fire events I think will probably be very similar and having been out in the field and actually done some ground validation with uh, Powler at ERI um, there definitely does seem to be um, a ground motion element to uh, the sort of the fire intensity on the ground in terms of uh, total loss um, areas that had dropped a lot um, had very had pretty much burned down just to the little air. Whereas when you were going into the peak cuts and things in the north, you were getting uh, sort of two centimetres of total loss. So, and, and slopes were very vulnerable compared to flatter areas and things like that. So there is a definitely a sort of, ha a, a, yeah, a ground motion response that we should be able to measure, but we haven't done that yet. <laughs> so, but that's the next thing. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks Thanks for summarising that. Um, so in the, the... <laughs> So, yeah, in the realms of, of democracy, we'll go for the next most popular question, although I think it's probably a very rapid response because I think we've already touched on it, really. Um, so do the scenarios of future unsuitable climate for peatlands justify not doing any more peatland restoration and giving up on peatlands and using them for something else? And I think we probably answered that with a resounding no from our first question. But would anybody like to anybody like to expand on that? Or shall we move on? Can I just add one thing on that, Sarah, which is that if, if the UK wants to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions, we cannot give up on peatland restoration. It's just not even an option. Um, it's not about saying that peatlands are, are no, you know, peatlands are at risk. So we should we should just put them to one side. They are absolutely fundamental to meeting net zero. And in order to do that, we need to make sure they're resilient. 
that's why we're calling for 100% restoration target rather than the much lower target that the government's already signed up to. So to, to not do that is almost not an option if you if we want as a country to, to be addressing climate change properly. And uh, if I can just add, uh, Chris Marshall has already pointed out the, the resilience of peatlands that are in better condition when faced with uh, malign influences, uh, such as burning or drainage. Uh, but the other thing to bear in mind is that, of course, uh, warmer air temperatures can contain uh, more moisture. Uh, and uh, any sailor will tell you that if you're going to have a hot day the next day, you will get a really heavy dew. Now, the thing about mosses is they don't have a, a waterproof cuticle, so they can take advantage of, of this heavy dew. They can take advantage of low cloud and climate uh, projections are not very good at dealing with cloud cover and so on. So even though the apparent rainfall might be zero, you can, from a moss's point of view, still be receiving all the moisture you need every night. So I think, you know, there's a danger that um, assumptions about climate projection, proje projections are painting a, a rather gloomy picture for peatlands in particular, but actually peatlands in particular are good at coping with and benefiting from conditions that we're not actually very good at measuring. That segues perfectly, I think, onto the next next question, um, which is, is around long-term monitoring. So with uncertainties on climate impacts on peatlands uh, and on peatland diversity, are we doing enough long-term monitoring to inform us about actual trends? And Chris Fry is adamantly shaking his head in the bottom corner. So I'll go to Chris um, first, if you'd like to come in on that, Chris. Of course we're not. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know that it's a to anybody, really. I mean, I, I know that I've met, got great information from the Roaches, where a community science project was doing work there. And then we happened to get there for before and after data from the wildlife in 2018, which has been incredibly insightful. So I, I, I'd have to support long-term data more and more and more, especially if I want to increase the toolkit for restoration. We haven't got enough, our toolkit is incomplete. We're still working on it. We need to innovate, but we need to understand the impacts of what we're doing. We can't just charge head blindly. We need that long-term monitoring to understand the impacts of all our tools and potential tools to know exactly how we're working them. Agreed. And I think long-term monitoring has... Not not for the first time, not for the first conference, and I know it's a source of frustration for some. Um, obviously, long-term monitoring and the need for evidence has been a recurring theme over the last four days, I think. Um, and I am going to have a shameless plug for the, the IUCN UK peatland programme's Eyes on the Bog uh, long-term monitoring initiative, um, which is using robust, low-tech um, methodology to monitor long-term uh, condition assessment of peatlands. Um, so I think that's that's worth worth a flag there. Um, I'm very conscious of time, so we'll pick pick another question. Um, so we'll move on. So to Richard, how much of a risk is there? This might not be a quick answer. How much of a risk is there, in your view, of peat slides on restoration projects? Peat is an unusual ecosystem, an unusual habitat, because the material below ground has about as much solid as a jellyfish. But the surface layer in a natural peatland is, uh, it acts as the protective binding layer all the fibrous nature acts as a, a really strong geotextile. Um, and it's when we break that textile that we, with a drain or whatever that we, uh, we destabilize the system. So in terms of restoration, the whole point is what we're doing is recreating that geotextile coating. Uh, so the more we can develop that, that coating, the, the less um, we are likely to see slope, slope 
uh, failure, uh, the more we are going to be enabling the bog to avoid slope failure. So actually, I think restoration is absolutely the thing we should be doing. If we don't restore, then uh, with increasing rainstorms and so on, dry periods, peat cracking, I'm sure we're going to see lots more peat slides. They've already had a remarkable number of peat slides in the Shetlands over the last 10 years to the point where it's become a, a, a major talking point. Uh, we could see this spreading much more widely unless we get, get on and restore. And I think that's probably a perfect, perfect message to end on there. So we're now at the, the end of our time for this session. We do have some questions that we didn't we didn't get round to answering. Um, and those will be posted on the notice board on the conference platform. Should anyone want to carry on discussions around those? Um, so it just remains for me to thank our panel of speakers. Thank you ever so much. Um, and Rob, the technician, for doing a fabulous job over the last few days. Um, that's the end of this session. The next session, which will be a motivational roundup um, across the four days, will start at four o'clock. Um, and if any of you in the break want to leave us some feedback on the conference, it will help shape future events, including the COP26 pavilion. Um, and we'd much appreciate if you can find that in the menu on the conference platform. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>